Thank you everybody for coming. Um, I think we're going to start the day off. Um, we've got some fantastic speakers for you today and um, uh, hopefully the children are all being well looked after around the hospital, enjoying the, the facilities that we have in this amazing place. Um, I'm just going to start by introducing Usher Kids since I'm, I'm Holly Feller and I'm Harry's mum. I'm also Tess and Alice's mum. And this is Emily. Shepherd, who is Lewis's mum and also Frankie's mum. And uh, we are the co-founders of Usher Kids and we're absolutely privileged to have all of you here today. It's really quite overwhelming. Um, it is a bit cosy in here. Um, the bathrooms are straight across. If you need to come out for water, please feel free to do that at any point. There are some um, uh, volunteers helping us with the Usher Kids t-shirt on so they can help you um, if you need it. So um, I'm just going to start the proceedings off with a, just a quick opening um, and then we're going to show you a bit before we have our keynote speaker, Mark Dunny. Um, so today marks the first ever Usher Syndrome Awareness event um, and it was destined to start life as a small barbecue for a few families who we linked as, as a result of forming our Usher Kids group. But if I was writing this introduction three weeks ago, I would be explaining how Emily and I came to form our support group and how the boys met and how a newspaper article in the Herald Sun three years ago changed our lives. But the newspaper article was anniversarised um, a few weeks ago and that turned into an avalanche of media for Usher Syndrome in Australia and has now changed the lives of a small village of Usher families and supporters, many of whom are here today or listening through the live stream. We precipitated our website launch to coincide with Rare Diseases Day this February and four families found us as a result of moving online. Then the domino effect could be the only way to describe the last three weeks that we have been through. Three weeks ago, 837,000 people read the Herald Sun paper on a Saturday. And from this article, two more families connected with us to say they wanted to be part of our Usher family in Australia. We grew from two in Melbourne plus one in New South Wales and Queensland who had all attended the Usher Coalition Symposium in June in 2013 to 10 families in our tribe. We knew we needed to bring them together as we could pro proclaim this in our mission statement. So we went about our business after the Herald Sun and started sharing our individual journeys to support the global Usher um, community in the 26-day awareness campaign leading up to the autumn equinox, which is today. A simple decision to involve Harry in ours by incorporating this compelling obsession with trains led to a viral campaign of people on social media taking photos at train stations themselves all around the world. Metro Trains Melbourne jumped on board and toot toot, we had our first TV experience with Channel 7 taking our awareness campaign out to a further 380,000 people on last Friday night's broadcast. Further 70,000 views have been hit on their, web, on their Facebook page and the newspaper article also pulled in an experience for the boys yesterday. Sunrise did a crossover on Friday which was another 30,000 viewers plus 80,000 at the Hawks School Dog Game last night. So that takes us to 1.5 million people in Australia that have now heard about Usher Syndrome in the last three or four weeks. And that doesn't even count the number of people who watched the game on national TV and saw those boys run across the gym. 1.9 million. Another 1.9 million. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one big village. And look at this room today. It is a bit cramped, but hopefully not too uncomfortable for you. But we are overwhelmed with the response and the obvious need to bring everyone together to build this community. And we will advocate, we will educate, and we will support each other. And now to our esteemed speakers. But first, you need to watch the boys on Sundays. <laughs> I think our viewers are going to love little Lewis and Harry who both have a rare condition called Usher Syndrome. Now they're very excited because tonight they get to run onto the MCG and through the banner with their beloved Hawks before the big semi-final but it's going to be hard to top yesterday when they got a big surprise from their footy hero. Cyril Rioli is a superstar of the AFL. What am I? I know I'm Cyril crazy. Bruce McAvaney's Cyril crazy, and he's not the only one. Who's your favourite player? Look at me in the eyes, please. Who's your favourite player? 
Cyril. Cyril. This is five-year-old Harry and his six-year-old mate Lewis. Both have an extremely rare condition called Usher syndrome. The kids are born profoundly deaf and then will gradually lose their sight as they get older. It's quite um, a shock to find out that your child isn't going to be the child you thought they were and that they're going to have a rough road in life. Cochlear implants mean the boys will have some hearing throughout their lives, but cruelly their eyes are deteriorating quickly. They already have night blindness. His peripheral vision is really closing in um, and that's really scary as a parent to, to notice that. Nighttime is just particularly scary for a six-year-old who can't see and can't hear. That's why the two families want to create lifelong memories now. Just like this special surprise. <gasps> Cyril Rioli! Hello! Oh my goodness. How are you going? i got some presents for you. Amid all this excitement, the boys still remembered their manners. Thank you, Cyril. What number's on the back? Can you turn around and yell out what number's on the back? 33! Who's that? Cyril Rioli! <laughs> Do you want to go and have a kick of the footy? Yeah. Ready to greet them on the training track was Hawthorne's legendary captain, Luke Hodge. Ah, <laughs> good kick. Days like today just really mean that we can just step away from his diagnosis for, for a moment and just enjoy the now. The boys have just got this beautiful friendship and we just hope that that grows together so when they're teenagers having a really hard time that they can really uh, lean on each other. So what does it mean to you to be able to share it with other parents who are going through the same sort of thing? It's a really big help. And then you have somebody that you can bounce ideas off and just have a shoulder to cry on if you need to. Meeting Holly just meant that we were no longer alone. Together, Holly and Emily have established Usher Kids Australia. The organisation needs help raising money to fund more medical studies into the condition. We're really hopeful that research can um, catch up really and give these boys a brighter future. Their future will have its challenges, but Lewis and Harry will leave Hawthorne with magic memories. They could have left with even more. If you don't tell anyone, you can take that home. All right? If you, go, you can take that home. Um, I, I right. already have one at home. You got, do you want another one? No. You don't? I don't need one. <laughs> you don't need one? No. Well, fair enough. Good honesty. <laughs> Best day ever! Best day ever! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, well done and thank you to the Hawks for doing that for the boys and taking time out before a big match. Now tomorrow is Usher Awareness Day here at the Royal Children's Hospital. Usher Kids Australia really needs some help so please support them. The website details are on our Sunrise website. Yeah. Now I'm going to introduce Mark Danny and just in case you're worried, you didn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm extremely excited to be here. Um, this is our second annual Usher Syndrome Awareness Day. Uh, oh, Danny, you waving me? You're waving me out the door. Okay, good. <laughs> so this is our uh, second annual Usher Syndrome Awareness Day. Thank you. Um, and uh, we uh, call it the Own the Equinox event uh, because uh, we, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, where I'm from, Boston, you can't help by the accent, I'm from, from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, it is uh, the equinox, the fall equinox, not the spring equinox. Uh, the fall equinox is the point in time where the days start to turn uh, more darkness, have more darkness than light. And so we felt that that was a good metaphor for the battle we face with Usherson. And uh, what we've been able to do with this global only equinox event is to try and push off the darkness. And so we start the event down here in Australia. Last year, uh, Dave ran a marathon yep. uh, on uh, the opening of the Usher Syndrome Awareness Day down here. He ran the Sydney Marathon? Or the, no, just in Moriah. Uh, so he ran around here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I ran the Equinox Marathon in Fairbanks last year. <clears throat> and so our day started at 8 a.m. down here in Australia. And then it ended at 8 p.m. in uh, with the sun going down in Fairbanks, Alaska. But instead of it being 12 hours, if you do the, with the, through the magic of time zones, 
our 12-hour day actually got lasted like 18 hours or something like that. Okay, so we were able to push off the darkness. So that's our only equinox event. And uh, Dave started off by running a marathon here, and then the last person to uh, finish among our group was a gentleman by the name of Brian Switzer, who has Usher syndrome, and ran the Equinox Marathon in Alaska, which is one of the 10 hardest marathons in the world. Um, he ran it blind. He ran it guided. It was his first marathon, um, and uh, he completed the whole thing. Um, and so uh, it was. This has been just a wonderful uh, event for us last year, and this year it's even better down here, uh, thanks to uh, to Holly and Emily and their families. And uh, I feel a little guilty because I feel like I kind of pushed Holly and Emily by telling them I was coming down here and would they like to do something. And of course they did all of this, so um, I feel like I'm going to push them even more every year. So imagine if I actually <laughs> thought about it, uh, what they could have accomplished. So, um, so this is, uh, so we're going to aim for like 10 million next year. <laughs> 3.4 wasn't enough this year. So um, so, uh, so thank you again for having me down here. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm the uh, chairman and founder of the Usher Syndrome Coalition. I'll talk about what, what that is. I have a whole bunch of titles. I'm the chairman and founder of the Decibels Foundation, which uh, supports kids with uh, hearing loss in the Boston area. Um, I'm also the Director of Information Technology for a consulting firm, but the only title that really matters, because all these others depend on these, is that I'm the father of uh, Bella and Jack. Um, Bella is uh, 17 years old. Um, she was, uh, she has Usher Syndrome. She was born deaf. She got a co first cochlear implant when she was two years old, and then uh, she uh, um, did only sign language until she was three years old. <coughs> Um, I uh, am realizing that I share a language down here, a spoken language down here, but I don't share a sign language down here, so, so my sign doesn't translate down here. Um, Bella was diagnosed with Usher syndrome when she was eight years old. Uh, she loves horses. That's her in Alaska last year, and that's the sun going down on the equinox last year in Alaska. Um, she took the picture. You can see there's the horse. The horse's head never up the top. Um, she loves to ride horses. Uh, she enjoy, really likes music, um, and uh, she um, commits to the idea that, that if you can't sing well, sing really loud. Um, and then uh, she's also an excellent photographer. She took that picture. Uh, the reason I tell you those things is because uh, if you're not familiar with Usher syndrome, Usher syndrome is the most common cause of combined deafness and blindness. I know most of the people in this room know this. Okay. Um, but it's congenital uh, hearing loss with progressive vision loss. So kids are born with hearing loss. And then over time, people with Usher syndrome lose their vision to retinitis pigmentosa. And that's a narrowing of the vision. And it will go down to a pinhole, and then eventually people lose their vision completely. Um, and it was first described by this guy, Albert von Grefe, uh, in Germany. But he didn't do the first definitive study. It was Charles Usher who did that. So. Uh, he stole the title, so he's not, it's not Usher's, disease, Usher's syndrome. Uh, but I like to think of it as Kimberling's disease. This is Bill Kimberling. He was the first Usher syndrome researcher, the first researcher to really commit his research to Usher syndrome. Um, he was also one of the founders of the Usher syndrome coalition, along with me. Um, and last year, he was honored by, uh, at the University of Iowa, they dedicated the first Usher syndrome dedicated research laboratory. Uh, in, at the University of Iowa. So there's now the Kimberling Usher Research Laboratory at the University of Iowa. Um, Usher syndrome uh, is a uh, orphan disease. So uh, it's very, very rare. Um, about three percent, historically we diagnosed about 3% of patients who had congenital, congenital bilateral sensory neural hearing loss as having Usher syndrome. Congenital means you have it at birth. Uh, bilateral means it's in both ears, and sensory neural means it uh, affects the hair cells in the cochlear, not the structure of the cochlear. Okay? So about 3% of people historically get diagnosed with that. But once we started doing genetic testing, we realized that it's closer to 8 to 12% of people with uh, bilateral sensory neural hearing loss have Usher syndrome. That's important because it meant that we were missing about somewhere between 5 to 9% of people in the world who had Usher syndrome. The question was, why are we missing those people? I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. 
Um, so that if you do the math, that works out to about uh, 30 to 50,000 people in the United States. It's somewhere between 2,500 and 4,000 people in Australia. It's at least 400,000 people worldwide. It could be as many as a million people worldwide. Now to go back to that picture of Bella, where she's riding a horse, and I told you she likes music and she's a very good photographer. Well, people with Usher syndrome have hearing loss, they have vision loss, and they also have vestibular problems, so they have balance issues as well. Uh, and so when I tell people that Bella likes music, likes to take likes photography, and likes to ride horses, that doesn't seem what you, like what you would normally expect out of someone with Usher syndrome. But that's the point, right? That's why we do these Usher syndrome awareness days, is so that people can actually understand what it means to have Usher syndrome. It's terrifying in a lot of ways. And some of the things I'm going to talk to you about today are going to be scary, especially for parents with younger kids. But there's a ton of hope. I'm going to stress that as we go through this as well. So when I get as I go through the scary part, just bear with me. I'm going to get to the hopeful part. But if you have kids, if you have young kids with Usher syndrome, I want you to go back to the 17-year-old Bella sitting on that horse smiling. That's their future, okay? Regardless of what we find for treatments, that's their future. Do you have a question? No, I was actually going to say, I've got Jai here, he's 16. Yeah. And so, yeah, he's, he's sitting in to listen to this. So, and we're doing pretty well so far, so good. no worries. Yeah, just to let the mothers know. Yeah, good. That's excellent. So I'll have to get you in touch with Bella. Mm. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so keep that in mind as you talk about this stuff, okay? Usher syndrome is not a death sentence. Um, it can be very scary, but it can also be terrific. Because as Holly and Emily can attest, it can really grow your family. Um, I am down here in Melbourne right now, and I uh, am being treated like a family by these guys. Okay, and I only have that because of ushers and because of the connection we have. So community is really the cure for usher syndrome. I'll talk about how it's going to be literally the cure for usher syndrome as we, because uh, the community is going to be necessary for us to find treatments. But it's also Figuratively, the cure is how we survive with people with having Usher syndrome. It's through this community. Okay, that's the treatment. For it. So rather than uh, the social isolation that can come from it, the goal here is to build a community that uh, makes us stronger and makes us happy. And I can't tell you how happy I am to be here, so I can tell you that that's a good. Thing. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about research for a second. Okay. There's a thing called the research continuum. And that's this diagram here, okay? Um, and this is how uh, things move from an idea to a treatment. So it starts with basic research, which is uh, the petri dish, dish and the, uh, the uh, theory and just the idea around something and testing it out in uh, the lab, okay? Eventually you get to translational research, which is where you say, hey, I have this thing that I think works. But I want to try it in people, but before I can do that, i got to try it in animals and other models. Okay, so that's translational There's 50 percent of people with Usher syndrome can still read the newspaper. Okay, does that sound like blind to you? Would that be your definition of blind? Yes? No? No. Okay, good. Good. We're still here. Right here. Okay. Um, and the truth is that a child born today is highly unlikely to lose their vision. Remember that chart I showed you with all the stuff that's in green that's just about to go into clinical trial? Well, if kids are going if a kid born today has 50 years before they fully fully lose their vision, and all that stuff is on the green line, there's no way that's going to happen, right? I mean, that's the, some of that stuff's going to go over the line and going to save their vision or delay the vision loss. So the chances are very strong that a kid born today is not going to lose their vision. So when someone sits down and gives that diagnosis to people, they're just probably flat out wrong, right? 
Um, and then we talked about deafness, right? I mean, deaf is not deaf. Bella likes music, okay? She sings. She talked, called me up on the phone. I was at dinner with, uh, with these guys. She called me up on the phone and asked me about something school-related, you know, just like a normal, normal kid would, right? That's not what we would expect from someone who is deaf. She signed until she was three years old. She understands sign language now, but she doesn't sign. She just uses oral communication. Right? Um, so the bottom line is that Usher <coughs> syndrome is simply not a death sentence. Um, people with Usher syndrome have athletic success. If you've been following me on Twitter at all, or following any of this stuff, we've had multiple people with Usher syndrome who've won um, uh, gold me uh, won medals at the uh, Rio uh, Paralympics, including a gold medalist from Australia who has Usher syndrome. Uh, one in a triathlon, I think. Um, so they have athletic success. They go to college. Bella is uh, applying to colleges right now, as Jen knows. We go through this process of uh, trying to get Bella off to college. But kids with Usher syndrome, they go to college if they want to. They get married. They have kids, right? Uh, so they get married. They have kids. They can have successful careers. They can accomplish pretty much anything. Um, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it can be done. Okay, so. That's the, this is what I tell physicians when I talk to them. I, I give this talk frequently to, to uh, physician groups as well, and I stress this part of them. If you're going to talk about the bad stuff, you've got to talk about this stuff, because that's as much <coughs> the prognosis for people with Usher syndrome as the bad stuff is. All right, so the Usher Syndrome Coalition's mission is to raise awareness and accelerate research for, uh, for Usher syndrome. Okay? And the way we're doing that um, is by providing support to families so that they have that community uh, with the goal of identifying and genetically testing every person in the world who has Usher syndrome. We maintain a uh, Usher syndrome registry. It's called the Usher Trust. It's the largest Usher syndrome registry in the world. It's the largest single source of families with Usher syndrome. We have uh, more than 1,500 families in that uh, registry at this point. They're from 52 different countries. And I love the story of uh, how the registry got built. I was, I was involved in it, but um, it was developed by this guy named Monty Iyer, who has, uh, he's one of my heroes. Um, he has Usher syndrome, and he had lost his job because, as a programmer because his vision had narrowed so far. Um, and so uh, he volunteered his time to develop the registry, and he developed it character by character, because you can only see one character on the screen at a time. So he did it character by character and developed this whole registry which is uh, a, that's available online. It's HIPAA compliant, which is a uh, US uh, regulation for <coughs> protecting uh, personal data. But it's HIPAA compliant. It's available in multiple languages. We have other languages in development. Um, but uh, he did all of this stuff for us. Um, you can access it at usher-registry.org or get to it through our Usher Syndrome Coalition website. Uh, if you have not registered, I strongly strongly advise you to do so for all the reasons that we've talked about. Um, all we require from people is just their name and email. We just want to be able to get in touch with you. Right? So that as we move forward with, uh, with these clinical trials and with the research that you know about it, and then you can decide where you want to be involved and where you don't want to be involved. Okay. All right. uh, we also are running a program called Unraveling Ush. This is done through the William J. Kimberling Usher Laboratory at the University of Iowa, where we're providing genetic testing for families with Usher syndrome. So if you've not been genetically tested, you can submit your, uh, your blood sample to, um, to the University of Iowa, and they will do the genetic testing on it. Um, we, there is actually some free testing available for people who qualify for it, uh, but uh, we've been doing it sort of on a pay-it-forward basis, so if you can afford to pay for two tests, we're asking people to pay for two tests and then take one, and then we use the other one for people who can't afford it. Um, uh, but more and more countries are providing genetic testing. In fact, we were talking about uh, some of the potential testing options that are going to be coming through here in, in Australia. Uh, yeah, so they're going to talk more about that later, but later, late, 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 except like you. Um, <laughs> we'll be talking more about that later. Uh, and, uh, but, but so more and more countries are doing this. In fact, in Sweden, they automatically test kids who are deaf uh, genetically. So some countries automatically provide it. In the U.S., it's a problem. Some other countries, uh, it's a problem. So uh, this is there for uh, families that need it. Okay. Uh, so I talked about the research continuum. Um, so we have sort of taken that, stolen that research continuum and turned it into what we call the hope continuum, which is what we do for families as they get initially diagnosed. Initially, they don't have a lot of hope. We try and provide that to them. And it, by providing them hope, we can move them along 
um, through this continuum to the point where they really want to be participants in the community. It's not an easy thing to do when you get the diagnosis. Families need time to deal with the emotion of the diagnosis. A lot of families don't want to talk to anybody. A lot of families go into shelves for a while. They don't look into anything. They just disappear from the, from the radar. Some of them just want to dabble online and just kind of poke around and see what's out there. Um, so we provide information along all that whole row of things. Um, the way we look at it is that families kind of want basic knowledge initially, just kind of tell me what the disease is. I'll look around online to see what it means, but that's about it. Eventually, they start to follow the research, and they want to learn more about the community uh, and learn more about what's going on. Eventually, they reach the point where they're willing to, uh, to make connections within that community. So often, the first point is that they want to talk to the experts. Okay, They want to talk to me. They want to talk to doctors or physicians, but they're really not quite ready to talk to any other families. Um, in phase two of the connections phase, they, tend, they want to try and meet other kids with Usher syndrome or other adults like them with Usher syndrome, but they don't want to see people in other places, uh, other phases of the community. And eventually we get them to the point where they participate in the larger community. And once they start to participate uh, in this, uh, the larger Usher syndrome community, then that's when they can get involved in the research stuff and really get uh, involved in advocacy in some of the larger things. Code yeah. Ray. Code Grey, North Building, Level 1, Kelby, 131. Code Grey, North Building, Level 1, Kelby, 131. Is that the way they come in? I'm going over on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So, I'll, um, so for the, the beginning part of this whole continuum, what we do is we have our website, which is usher-syndrome.org, uh, that you can access. We have dozens of information about the disease, but in general, the website just has a sense of hope. So when they first find, when you search Usher syndrome, often one of the first things you find is our website, and we want you to feel like there's hope when you first find out about it. Um, we're also going to be launching Usher Talks. You'll start seeing those right after the, the, the um, end of the On the Equinox campaign. We're going to be launching our Usher Talks, and these are accessible um, controllable, where you can go forward and backward, uh, videos that are captioned about the latest Usher syndrome research in the community. So we'll be having all the latest Usher syndrome, all the Usher syndrome researchers in the world, all the leading Usher syndrome researchers in the world will be up there giving their talks, and you'll be able to see all that information. Okay. Um, and then we also do quarterly newsletters that you can sign up for. When people start to reach the point where they want to be involved with connections, uh, with uh, making connections to other families, we offer what is called the Ush Blue Book Family Network. Um, we have over 500 families from 30 different countries in this uh, in this family form. Um, it, all you have to do is just sign up at the registry, and you sign up for the Ush Blue Book, and then you we send your email address out to everyone who's already part of it, and then they'll contact you. So you don't have to worry about you. Uh, once you are in the Ush Blue Book, we don't just send your information out randomly to people. Um, they, you have to decide who you want to contact. Okay? Uh, but there's also an online form that we just started, which has been extremely successful, which is a great offer place for you to go into and uh, just ask questions um, about Usher syndrome and get advice from people. Um, Bella, my daughter, was having problems with um, uh, making friends in high school. She's a great kid, very friendly has no problem connecting with people, but for some reason she's having trouble making connections in high school. And so I asked that question on the Blue Book forum. I got a ton of great advice from people, and a lot of people who have gone through the similar sort of things. Um, so it's great stuff. And so just so you know, I even I go on there to ask for advice. Okay. And of course, we're on social media. Uh, you can follow us at, at Usher Coalition. I'm at Usher Chair, if you want to follow me. Jen is tweeting me right now. Um, so, uh, so you can follow us there as well. And we're on Facebook, uh, which has a five-star rating for people who reviewed us. Uh, we also run annual family conferences, <coughs> similar to this. Um, the one we ran in uh, Seattle last year in uh, the U.S. sold out, just like this. Uh, and we had, but there we had a much bigger room. We had over 180 people uh, and attended. We had to turn families away. Uh, next year it's going to be in Chicago uh, in July. Um, it's a, it's. We do a full day there where we have um, families and researchers get together. We have child programs. It's a very similar format to this. It's just a little bit longer day. Um, and we try and make it very accessible. Uh, it's an opportunity for the community to meet. You can see this is uh, the type of thing that you find out of it. 
In fact, um, Bella, this is Bella uh, back in 2014, and this girl here is Claire. Um, and uh, Claire is from Tampa, Florida, which is a long way from, uh, from Boston. But they met at the, uh, um, one of our Usher Syndrome family days, and they became best friends. And so they text each other every day, and so now they're you know, best buddies. Um, and they met through, through this. Okay? In fact, this group of girls generally stays in touch with it. Um, the kids look very much look forward to going to these days. Even my son, who doesn't have Usher Syndrome, mm -hmm. looks very much forward to it because they've made friends over the years from showing up every year. So hopefully you'll find the same thing here today, where you can have a bunch of kids down there and make friends and, and want to come back again next year when they do it next year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, but but the, the reason it's so good for the kids at these things is because it's the, one of the few times in their lives where they are the majority. Uh, because down there right now, with all the kids that are down there, there's more usher kids than there are other kids, right? And the kids who are down there are all siblings who know how to deal with them. So uh, it really gives them a, a much different uh, perspective on the world than they know today. All right, and then we also run international symposiums. The last one we ran was uh, in Harvard Medical School in 2014. The next one's going to be in 2018 in Mainz, Germany. So get your tickets. Um, in fact, you better get your tickets because I think it's going to sell out. Um, and it's a great opportunity for, uh, we do a two-day families conference combined with a one-day, uh, excuse me, two-day researcher conference combined with a one-day family conference. But we invite the families to come and sit and listen to the researchers. They talk at like, you know, 30,000 feet way over your head on a lot of this stuff. But it's great to hear what they're working on. And, to, and then, most importantly, it gives them an opportunity to connect. So this is Ed Stone, who's one of the leading Usher syndrome researchers in the world. And you can see him sitting down here having a glass of wine with two people you might be familiar with. That's Emily and Dave uh, back in Boston. Right? And so uh, it's a great opportunity to just sit down with people who are know all about the science of Usher syndrome and deal with them uh, just like you would deal with your, your friends. Okay? Uh, and so I uh, strongly encourage you to, to try and come to these things. Okay. Uh, so. When people get involved, there's a lot of ways you can get involved. The easiest way is to just join that Ush Trust, get your name in there so we're in touch with you. Um, but people who are uh, join the family network eventually become mentors within that family network. They're the ones who are reaching out. I know Dan has a great uh, story about this, about uh, <coughs> uh, passing on information that I had passed on to him to the next family that he that had reached out to him. Um, so it's a great opportunity to, to, um, to become mentors. Um, we ask for volunteer, people can volunteer at these different events that we run. Um, they people do uh, fundraising, they do advocacy. Um, we've had participation in psychosocial studies. Um, the Ush Trust actually was uh, a source of information that uh, has driven research as well. Uh, we found out that there's a connection between um, irritable bowel disease and Usher syndrome through uh, doing a survey of people in the Ush Trust. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, like I said, the candidates for clinical trials, and ultimately, you are the, uh, the the market for um, <coughs> for these pharmaceutical companies. Okay. All right. So that's it for me. How's that going? Hello, everyone. Um, thanks, Holly. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks to uh, Emily and Holly for organizing the day and for inviting me along to talk. Um, and it's great to hear Mark speak. I've um, followed Mark on social media and a lot of what he's done over, over the last few years, and um, it's great to finally, I haven't actually met him officially yet, but it's great, you know, it's, it's, uh, great to hear him talk and, um, and touch on a lot of things, um, a lot of important things that are going on uh, in terms of research. Um, there's, a, there's, obviously, there's going to be a, a few common threads with what I'll talk about, um, with what Mark's spoken about. Um, my focus will be more on the community side of things. Um, I'm one of those people that, um, that Mark was talking about where uh, in the early stages of being diagnosed, uh, my family and I didn't know anything about Usher and uh, didn't have any support networks and therefore we just sort of did their own lives and tried to deal with it the best we could. Um, so I guess um, when I was age 15 when I was diagnosed, Quite a shock to um, know that I wasn't just a deaf kid, I was a hearing impaired kid, I was also going to be uh, someone that had to do with going blind. Um, so, this is going back about 20 years now, almost 20 years. Um, and to, to see 
that everyone's in day and to see the, um, the support that's out there um, around the world. Um, it's free. I didn't have that when I was growing up, so uh, we have to do a lot of things on our own. And, you know, um, ophthalmologists, you know, when we got diagnosed, we'd say, look, you're going to go blind and you need to get a good pair of sunglasses. Um, the glare is going to be affecting your eyes and, and then just go off and do one on your own. So it was pretty hard to take um, back then and, and learning to do with it and having a family that didn't understand what it was, what the future was going to look like. Um, I certainly didn't know what the future was going to look like. Um, I was, uh, I wasn't still am very passionate about sport and when I was 15 and I told that I was going blind, it was the first thought that went through my head is that uh, we're going to be able to play sport. Picture going blind is where you're looking about it. <coughs> um, I didn't know much about disability sports back then, so that wasn't even an option. Um, so uh, basically spent the next 10 years just just trotting along, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, again, not having any support networks, um, not knowing anyone with the same disability, recognised people in Tosa. So it was quite, it was quite isolating. Um, uh, and as Mark touched on before, a lot of these people that have us um, decide that there's nothing they can do about it, there's no cure. Um, so they don't go and see specialists and get regular checkups and um, try and try to where they're at with their vision. And that was pretty much what happened for me. Um, until I got to about age 26, um, my, my GP very wisely said that I needed to start dealing with the fact that I was going blind. Um, I came to him with some anxiety and depression issues. Um, and, uh, and they stemmed from, um, well basically after I saw him, I went and saw the ophthalmologist and had a bit of a reality check. Um, it had been about 10 years since I was um, diagnosed and I um, went in and they, the ophthalmologist basically confirmed that yes, you are going blind, your vision's got a lot worse um, and there's not much we can do for you at this stage, so there's still no cure in the site. So this is about eight or nine years ago. So um, still at that point there were no support networks, there was no no one I could turn to, no one that understood um, what I was dealing with. Um, so if, if, you don't, if you try to figure these things out on your own when you're a young person, um, it is quite difficult to know, um, you know what's coming ahead. Um, and then um, <laughs> just shortly after that my uh, my mum suggested this is when Facebook came out, so it's sort of a brand new thing there. And she suggested I go on Facebook and have a look and just see if there's any support groups on there. And there was one support group that popped up and it was um, based around the International uh, Retina Congress, I think it's every two years. And they had a, um, a youth group that formed, it was in uh, I think Finland, they had a, um, a congress and it um, was about a dozen or so young people with RP, but most of them so. Started communicating and um, started to form these groups around these um, congresses and go for like, two or three days. Uh, and that was the first time I had, had actually made any contact with anyone that had a similar disability. It wasn't our shop, but it was similar in that they were going blind and they were young and they had similar stories. And, um, that then led to me deciding that I wanted to challenge myself and go to live overseas, um, something I've been wanting to do for a long time. Uh, when I, I moved to the Netherlands, and shortly before I was there, I was travelling around Europe and, and actually organised a meeting for young people, uh, same age as me at the time, who also had RP. And that was, when I back on it, was probably the most pivotal moment for me was because I could finally um, talk to people who were on the same age and who, who understood what I was dealing with and had the same sort of stories, you know, about tripping over and running into things. And, they just, they just got it. I didn't have to try and do someone else or try and hide, hide my disability or, or um, you know, make up, you know, try and convince a, a dancer that I wasn't drunk, you know, that I was not <laughs> in the bar. Or, but they all understood it. Um, and it, was, it was having that, um, experiencing that, then set up what we're all here about today, which is about having a community. Even though I was at that stage of a very small community and now on the other side of the world, but um, that having met those um, young people who I'm still friends with today, I actually caught up to some of them a few months ago when I was over in Europe, and I 
the beginning of triathlon. Um, you know, uh, I think that, that set me up and allowed me to um, believe that the future was going to be okay and that um, I couldn't do anything I wanted to do. Um, you know, there were no limits that disability wasn't something that you needed to hide away from. Um, it was all of those guys were doing amazing things and, and um, you know, that sort of gave me the courage to want to go out and try try some new things as well. Um, uh, when I was eating in the Netherlands, I um, decided I'd get back into sport. I started off with rowing. Um, I couldn't swim, so it was a sport that you know, um, proved challenging because I had a fear of the water and didn't want to fall out of the boat. It wouldn't have been a good ending if I had fallen out of the boat, splashing around and knowing, knowing, no one knowing why I was uh, rowing a boat and I couldn't swim. Um, but while I was over there, I, I got back into a running, which I um, carried out when I was younger. And it was around that time, 2010, when uh, it was announced that the chart was going to be in power in Rio. And that, that then gave me the goal that I, you know, I wanted to get to a power big games. So I could actually go and compete in sport now um, on a level playing field, compete with people that had the same disability. Um, and, um, Basically, from that point, I got, got into triathlon. And, um, uh, everything, everything since that moment of coming home and getting into triathlon, having that goal, and um, having something to focus on, um, has just basically changed my life. And, um, you know, I'm doing things and meeting people that I never imagined that I would do. Um, and traveling around the world, competing in different countries. Um, and, uh, now I'm the number one triathlete in Australia, in Michigan Pair, top five in the world. Um, it's opened up a lot of doors. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the things that it's allowed me to do is uh, to be able to have a platform like this. I've spent uh, the last few years going to different events and speaking to um, in the vision and community, speaking to different family, whether it's just with our family or our Basically, just sharing my story and just letting people know, uh, parents know that the future is going to be okay. Um, obviously, technology and um, the research that's coming out now, the cure is not that far off. But I think from my experience in my life, going through the load and then getting to the point where I was okay with the fact that you know, I have a disability and that, you know, that's, that's not, life's going to be challenging, but, um, not going to stop me doing anything that I really want to do. Um, and, and I think sharing that with people and families um, is a very strong tradition to me. Um, will allow uh, people like yourself, if you now know that your kids are going to have a future, it's not going to be uh, super difficult. Like, you know, Bella being able to ride horses and listen to music and me going out and doing draft once, you know, that's, we're not doing anything different to what anyone else would do. So, I think, being able to share my story and show that this is going to be okay is, is an important thing because, you know, it could be five years till, till a research, um, till there's a cure, it could be ten years, it could be more, but I think allowing the kids to just keep living life and, and knowing that it's going to be okay, um, I think that's a really important thing to take away. Um, I'll finish off on um, Katie Kelly, she just won a goal at the Power which is quite amazing. Um, I trained with Katie, I have uh, about a year and a half, um, travel quite a lot in the same team, and, um, and um, we have obviously uh, a special bond because uh, we have the same disability. So, um, and when uh, she got a gold medal um, a few days ago, um, she's obviously been on the news and doing lots of interviews, and um, she's had a lot of people around her um, wanting her attention. But, Less, less than 24 hours after her race, I got a, an email on Facebook and she sent me a quiet message and just said, um, thank you for all your support. Um, you and I like, we're, we're like brother and sister with our bond that we share and um, she means this win was for us and was for everyone with us. So, I think I've had to take the time out of her juicy life and having achieved something so of people coming in and also trying to achieve you know, before you time to take it. That says a lot about the bond that you can have in the community. Um, and I think 
all the kids are hanging out <laughs> at the moment, I'm sure they're all going to share some um, for a lot longer than Kevin and I have. You know, for all the lows and the highs that are going to come in the future, that's a pretty important thing to have in focus. So, um, yeah, thanks for listening to my story. So, do you need a break to get the technology up and running? What do you need? What do you want? No, it's all right. Okay, thank you so much, Jonathan. He is an amazing guy. and. <laughs> so um, the next person we're going to introduce is um, Kate Morrell. She's a graphic designer but also a writer and more importantly a mum to some beautiful um, kids who are downstairs with our kids. She has actual syndrome type 2 um, and she writes to share her story. And so she um, uses writing as a therapy with her companion and her friend and we're absolutely delighted to have her talk to us today. Yes, of course. Is that enough or would you like us to pull the lines up as well, Kate? Um, yeah. 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 No, I'm very Well, I've just met Harry. He's big, so if he can do what he did last time, I can move it. <laughs> um, this is a very important day for me. It's Usher, as you know, it's Usher Syndrome Awareness Day, and I have Usher Syndrome. Now, I know it's not all about me, but just for a moment, can we just pretend that it is? I'm standing here today, I'm realising the dream. I'm standing here as a 45 year old, and I'm realising the dream of my 30 year old self. This is where she wanted to be. I have finally arrived. I may have taken the long, long path with many breakdowns, red stops and detours, but I have finally arrived to where I'm supposed to be. Five years ago, I took the first step on that path. When trying to find where in the world I fit in. I didn't quite fit in with the hearing impaired community, impaired community because I wasn't just hearing impaired. I didn't quite fit in with the vision impaired community because I wasn't just vision impaired. And as hard as I tried, with such determination, I was never going to fit in with the able community because I the non disabled community, even though I took half of able. Five years ago, I was depressed, desperate, and defeated. I was ready to give in and I was ready to give up. I only occasionally knew about Usher syndrome because it was on the letter of my early diagnosis from when I was 15, possibly Usher syndrome, my doctor had said. So I never identified with having Usher syndrome but I'd never been formally diagnosed. The five years ago, depressed, desperate and defeated, remembering those words, I searched on the internet for where I could fit in the world, anywhere that I could belong. And you know what I found, the Usher syndrome coalition. A place I could fit in, a place I would fit in, a place there were people just like me. My 13 year old self rejoiced. I was finally on the way to realising her dream. If I had not met another 13 year old, I would not be here today. Bella Dunning, my Dunning's daughter, was <coughs> that 13 year old. In 40 years, I have never come to know of anyone else with Usher syndrome, not one. Bella was the best. And Bella made me remember my better in your self. I realised that I'd taken the long, long path with breakdowns, rest stops and detours because I was on the run from who I was to become. I was on the run from what was to come. My 13 year old self I have left behind. And so I cried. I cried for what would become for me, my 13 year old self. I cried for what would become what I would have to become. I cried for Bella, for what would come for her and what Bella would have to become. I cried for all girls and boys in Russia syndrome, wherever they were in the world. I cried for us. 
what can I do, I thought. What can I do for me? What can I do for my seven-year-old self, for Bella, and all girls and boys with my shipping joint? What can I do? And I realized it was time to be a voice. It was time to be an inspiration. It was time to stop trying to fit in, and it was time to be me. And I made a promise. I will always have courage. I will believe in myself, always be true to myself. I will keep smiling, always laugh at myself. I will never stop dreaming, always have hope. I will do what it takes to be the best that I can be. This is my promise to me, to my 13-year-old self, to Bella, and to all girls and boys with Usher Syndrome. I reached out to Mark Dunning. He said I was an excellent writer and he was jealous of my talent and I've got the email. <laughs> <laughs> he also asked me to write for the blog. This was the first step on the path to standing here today. I wrote for me, I wrote for Bella, I wrote for all girls and boys in Russia Syndrome. And in doing so, I realised in my dream as a 13 year old, I dared to dream again. I dared to believe in dreams. And so, I, so here I am, realizing one of the dreams of my then 40 year old self to speak the words that I wrote. So, who am I? It's a simple question I wish I could say. I started off with Catherine, Katie followed before. At 16, I declared, I will now be known as Kate. I am Kate. I have been spent most of my life being Kate. But what else? I am a daughter. <coughs> I am a sister. I am a mother. And I'm a wife. That too, I know. Who are you, I think, thinking of me? Who is this girl? Hell, who is this woman? <laughs> are you really 45? <laughs> What's that to say? Hearing impaired too? Vision impaired as well. You're going blind. You have Usher syndrome. Oh boy, glad it's you, not me. Oh no, hang on, you are me. <laughs> Can I start over, please? Well, who am I? Well, something doesn't quite work in my ear. Something doesn't quite work in my eye. That's all. That's it. Usher syndrome is such a small part of who I am. But Usher syndrome is not who I am. I am this. I'm funny, no. <laughs> I can be funny. I trip, I stumble, I fall all the time. But I get up and I keep going. I'm determined. And I can laugh. If I didn't laugh, I might be quiet all the time. <laughs> I have to laugh. I can laugh. I am not special. I'm not blind. And I'm not courageous. Well, I am. But not because I have Usher syndrome. I am because I am me. I don't want to be treated as special. I don't want to be treated differently. I don't feel special. I am treated as special. I don't feel different. I am treated differently. Feeling I'm just like you. That's all. That's it. Something just doesn't work in my eyes. Something just doesn't work in my ears. That's all. That's it. All you need to know is see me as me. Forget Usher syndrome. Forget the condition. Forget the diagnosis, the prognosis, the outlook, the future. Forget all of that. Forget my ears. Forget my eyes. Forget everything. Just for one moment, see me as me. This is an important day for me. My third annual day. Finally!
And there are many benefits of genetic information. It helps confirm the eye disease, better understand it, more reliably identify other family members at risk, and use new cutting edge technology to find cures for blinding eye diseases. As made reference to earlier um, this morning, Usher's syndrome is an autosomal recessive um, inherited condition where a child has inherited a gene chain from each parent. That's often carriers and usually have good vision and hearing. There's at least 11 known genes to um, thought to be caused from Usher's syndrome. But today I'll be talking to you about the exciting work being done at um, CIRA and um, which has seen major breakthroughs for not only Usher's syndrome but a variety of inherited retinal dystrophies and optic neuropathies. <coughs> so to understand how cells become damaged and lead to blindness, we need to study those cells and understand what actually goes wrong. And that gives us a way of um, developing new drugs and treatments. And we can do this from stem cells, which are extremely powerful. A stem cell is a basic cell that can be any other cell of the body. So whether that's nerve tissue, a red blood cell, liver cells, and even an eye cell. So it can be very powerful. And we can obtain stem cells from embryos that have been developed by IVF or in vitro fertilization and donated for research with appropriate consent. But this, although it gives lots of hope, um, there have been major ethical challenges and raises difficult questions. However, new breakthroughs brought this debate to an end. So using mobile piloting technology, scientists have discovered ways to take an ordinary cell such as a skin sample and change it into a stem cell. And this opens up exciting new possibilities for stem cell therapies. I work with some very clever scientists and clinicians um, and the Clinical Genetics Unit and the Neurogeneration Unit headed by Alex Hewitt and Alex Pigbay who's sitting up the back um, today. And we've worked together, we've got a great team, and we've collected over 600 samples from people Australia-wide. Participants have um, a variety of different conditions, um, inherited retinal dystrophies, so RP, ushers, um, macular dystrophies, and inherited optic nerve diseases, retinoblastoma, which is an eye cancer, and we're taking the um, skin samples, which can be taken in the outpatient's clinic unit. Okay? So we just go back to our previous slide. So this is um, Professor Alex Hewitt and taking a skin sample from a patient. So it's about three millimetres of skin taken from the forearm, okay? And there are no stitches required for this procedure, um, just little stereo strips or band-aids that go on top and a waterproof dressing. So it's actually fairly straightforward to take the, um, the sample but we allow extra time, obviously, to discuss the project and um, for informed consent. So from these skin samples, we give them to our um, scientists who raise these samples, and then we can turn these into stem cells, which then can be turned into either retinal tissue or optic nerve tissue, which is extremely powerful and gets around the issues surrounding embryonic stem cells. Once the, the sample leaves the skin, there's no blood supply. So the samples have to be cared for like a little baby. Okay, So they have to be um, fed, they have to be watered, they have to be they change its little house, and it's very time consuming and labour intensive. Okay, So Helena, who's this wonderful lady here, she um, takes care of the initial um, skin sample once it leaves the, the patient's skin. Okay, So we could only process a handful of samples in a given week just from the time involved. Um, often the only work to come in every day or every second day, even over the holidays, to process these samples. But um, in late 2014, we received philanthropic um, a donation from the Clemenger Foundation and we were able to purchase Pierre. And he is a cell culturing um, robot who's able to feed and water these special cells. And um, so hence we can um, process and increase our recruitment rate 
for collecting participants. So it's pretty awesome to watch. Um, and yesterday I was working on my slides and um, I brought in my little um, boy, he's almost five, and the robot got going by Duncan. He was just amazed at how the little straws come in, they um, take out the, the bad food or the used food, then put the new food in, and then it goes back to its house. So it's truly quite amazing. So you thought 3D printers were all going to change the world, and then comes along this genetic editing technique, which I'll describe to you very shortly. And Science Magazine described it as the breakthrough of the year. So, so what is actually genetic editing? Well, sounds a bit too hard. Um, hopefully I can sort of um, explain in a basic way that you guys all can um, understand. So essentially we've got our DNA helix over here and we've got the gene, which is a spelling mistake in the DNA. And a special molecule, or essentially like a, a sap name, comes along the DNA to try and find the gene where it actually, um, where the spelling mistake is. So just to take a step back, we actually need to know the gene cause and the, um, the specific condition first, and that's why the importance of genetic testing to, to begin with. So we have the little sap nav that comes along the DNA to find that gene. Okay, we've found it. Okay. Then we have these special molecular scissors that come along and cut the DNA um, helix into half. So we've got two strands, and then we've got um, technology to actually edit and fix the gene. Okay, so this is actually in the in the dish. Okay, from the stem cell that we've created from the person's skin. So um, it's pretty much putting any tag on um, cut, copy, and paste essentially. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. And um, so I mentioned we've been able to do this in the actual dish for a variety of different inherited um, rational diseases. Okay, and so from that, we're moving now into the, um, the animal work. As Mark was saying, there's a process for how things get developed. And so we've done it in the dish. We've now moved into uh, a mouse model. And this work is headed by um, Dr. Sandy Boone and Rick um, Wu, who are the, the chief scientists working on this CRISPR or genetic editing technique. So what they're able to do is um, using a, um, applying the gen um, genetic editing um, material into a virus, okay, and then the virus is inje um, injected directly into the mouse eye to try and correct the spelling mistake causing the eye problem. And we do know that some genes are easier to fix than others, and it seems that, that deleting genes is actually a lot easier than, than replacing a missing gene. So, um, it's truly remarkable and exciting and certainly the technology that can be used um, and potentially for the next generation delivery of gene-based therapy. Mark touched on this uh, a bit earlier. Um, so moving on to human trials, we need to make sure the treatment is, is safe okay, and it's effective. Okay? We don't want to correct the gene. Um, but give you something nasty, so you do another cancer or have the, the molecular scissors chop out like other bits of breast nut. So it needs to be safe and it actually works. And um, so they're the things that we need to get ready, um, all the data together to then approach the TGA, which is the Australian equivalent of the FDA, um, to get regulation approval and um, tick all the boxes and dot the I's and, and cross the T's. So that's the work that we're moving on to, but um, it's truly quite remarkable. Um, so Editus is a, a biotech company in the States, and um, they have proposed that they're trying to get a genetic editing human trial for 2017, broken another type of RP, which is um, Labor's congenital amaurosis, which is an RP that affects children from a very young age and is quite severe. Um, so they're hoping to get it by 2017. However, the regulators, so that would be the FDA, so they haven't been approached yet for reviewing the trial, but that certainly would be um, coming forward, you would think. <clears throat> so if we look at human genetic editing in embryos, um, China are doing some basic research uh, for this. 
and the UK are uh, just been um, given approval to conduct um, research into um, embryos um, and so to try and understand why some pregnancies progress and, and others others don't. So that's some work that's doing human, human um, genetic in, in embryos. And um, this is a little girl in, um, in the UK who's one year old and she's now in remission following um, some gene um, editing um, of the immune samples, so, um, which is great work. And there were some quite a few documentaries on the, on the BBC. Like with a lot of technology, um, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, um, there are some ethical considerations and some people have felt that, um, that it could go too far with human genetic editing and um, see so designer babies or intelligent eye colour, uh, various athleticism. Um, there's also been suggestion that it could be leading to eugenics and potentially for genetic discrimination. So there are um, certainly some considerations. So I mentioned earlier that there's significant debate for embryonic stem cells, um, but there's probably a little work exploring the issue for this human genetic editing. And so we wanted to <coughs> gauge the public awareness um, and perception about um, this form of technology. And last year we had a, a Morish medical student, Tristan, and he worked with our group for one year, and he and colleagues developed this online survey um, assessing the acceptability for um, genetic editing in various different contexts. And so we applied the survey and it went out on Facebook, Twitter, Google, WeChat to um, all over the country and even internationally, so it was translated into various languages. And we actually received 12,000 responses from 185 countries. So the picture didn't come through too well, but there's a variety of different um, countries. Here's Australia over here, and so this is the rest of the um, international participants, which is truly amazing. And so what we found is that most people agree with genetic editing to cure life-threatening diseases and debilitating diseases. However, there were less support for non-health related purposes such as intelligence, eye colour, sporting ability, etc. So there's dramatic and exciting changes in the development of therapies. Um, I've just mentioned one, which is the stem cell work in genetic editing, and we've heard Mark earlier talk about the various different groups looking at gene, other gene therapies, optogenetics and people who are more advanced in their uh, course of their vision loss, that bionic eye might be um, more suitable for them. There are two groups in Melbourne conducting work on bionic eye. There's one through, um, through the Eye Near Hospital, which, is, which would be suitable for um, people with RP and various retinal dystrophies. And there's another type being um, work being done at Monash University, which could be for retinal and optic nerve um, conditions. Um, a lot of this work does take time and as you have been able to um, appreciate that it does, um, we need to make sure it's all safe and it, it actually is quite effective um, and it always takes longer than what we anticipate. But 100% guaranteed the improvements uh, at the moment will come from technical challenges, um, technical changes, um, which is like your um, your smartphones, the iPhone and the Androids. Um, even last year we saw um, a demonstration for a drug that was powered on down at Eastern Progress. So technology, just in, for everyday people, is remarkably changing and certainly we've got a lot of exciting research being not only conducted here in Melbourne, Australia, but internationally working very hard to find cures for various different inherited dystrophies, um, ushers, RP, etc. So this is our group and um, we're made up of um, different backgrounds. We've got orthoptists like myself, um, clinicians, um, nurses, and then we bring in Elise's group here um, who bring in the cell biology and the science. Um, and we, have a, we do have actually a great group that each brings um, a unique value to it. And so hopefully um, 
then if your doctor says there's no treatment on the horizon, you can sort of say, well, I've been to this talk here today and there's lots of exciting work being done here in Melbourne um, and overseas. So um, we can see a lot of things coming on the horizon. So I'd like to acknowledge all the colleagues um, and the various um, funding bodies. A lot of this research does rely on um, money, as, as you can imagine. And um, so we receive funding from NHMRC, which is the National Research Group here in Australia, um, various philanthropic foundations. Um, yeah, of course we could always do with some more. And, um, and so we do have um, philanthropic people fill out with our group to um, help get uh, money for research. So thank you. That was great. I'm sure um, Lisa um, can't stay for the whole event, but um, if you have any uh, significant questions, we can um, come through Emily and I and we'll um, forward them to the Centre for Eye Research on your behalf. So um, our next speaker is um, Dr Rachel Burke, and she is the group leader of the Molecular Hearing Laboratory and a senior research fellow at the Murdoch Research um, Children's Research Institute based here in the hospital. Um, her team and herself are working on a congenital deafness study which is providing genomic sequencing to infants picked up through this, the newborn screening here in Victoria. This is a pilot program and it's been funded by the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance and she's going to explain a bit more about it. Thank you so much. So I'll try not to talk too much, but I'm actually really excited to be speaking about this project on behalf of our team. There's a lot of people involved in this project here in the hospital. Um, it's the first time I've actually been able to talk about it in public, so it's really nice to be able to speak to people who might actually benefit from this research in the near future. So the project I'm talking about is called the Deafness Flagship Project, and it's being funded through this organisation called the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance. And as we go through, I'll tell you a bit more about that. Some don't need to tell you this, but congenital deafness is actually really prevalent in Australia and worldwide. Um, here in Australia, about 1,000 babies are picked up as being deaf at birth. Um, here in Victoria, in our state, it's about 60 to 70 babies every year are detected as having a, a hearing loss at birth. Um, it's a really important thing to detect early and we've improved in that over the last few years. Um, and being able to pick it up early means that we can intervene and practically help um, children with hearing impairment to actually um, live the best life that they can. Uh, the reason that we've improved in picking up babies early with hearing loss is through this pro program here called the Victoria Infant Hearing Screening Group. Program. Um, and we now detect 99% of babies with a hearing impairment within a couple of weeks of them being born. Um, that program commenced in 2005 uh, and we now have statewide coverage. So every baby born in Victoria, almost every baby born in Victoria, gets a hearing test within a couple of weeks of birth and most of them within a few days. Um, this is actually Joseph, who is the baby of one of the clinical geneticists that's actually working on on the Melbourne Genomics Project, and people will tell me about it. He passed his test, um, <laughs> but it's um, a test that's called an automated brain, brain stem response test. We're actually picking up brain waves in response to sound through that year that it's stuck on their head. Um, the problem that we still have, or the challenge that we still have, is that although we are able to tell parents that their baby has a hearing impairment, we're often not able to actually tell them why. And there are ways that we can figure out why a baby is deaf, but until recently we really didn't have the technology to do this cost effectively and efficiently, and so that's something that we've been really aware of for a long time. But it's only just in the last couple of years that we've had the technology available to us to really do much better genetic testing for babies who are born deaf. Part of the reason for that is that deafness is not just one condition, it's all very aware. It's a very broad spectrum <coughs> of causes, particularly genetic causes for hearing impairment. And it's been really hard to test all of those um, easily. 
this is a sort of breakdown of all the different types of deafness that we can detect. So we know that of all of these baby, babies that get given the diagnosis of deafness, about half of them have genetic causes and then the other half are non-genetic and all we don't really know what's going on. Um, of those people, or those children, about a third of them have a syndromic type of hearing impairment, so they're not just deaf, as you know, should say, there are other symptoms as well. Um, and the other um, group has deafness alone. And then of those um, children, there are lots of different ways that their deafness can be inherited, and there's a single gene that causes a large proportion of those called connexin 26, or what's also known as DTOB2. So up until recently, that's the only gene that we've ever been able to test for routinely for children in Australia. Uh, so it's a single gene test. Uh, a lot of people don't even want to have that test done. We're not really sure why that is, just the general community of um, clinical support groups haven't really been offering it widely to people. So a lot of um, people, children and families, we might get any genetic testing done at all. And if they do get any, all they get done at one is a single gene test. Um, there are some more uh, early adopters of modern technology in other parts of the world who have been doing gene panel sequencing for quite a long time now, or at least within the last couple of years, um, and they test for about 100 million deafness genes, and the usher genes tend to include those parents. Uh, again, that requires parents to be advocates for their children and to really seek that out in Australia at the moment. Uh, and it's a user pay system as well, so families actually have to pay to have that testing done a lot of the time. <coughs> what we have now is the ability to actually look at every gene in the genome using exome sequencing. Um, it's um, been around for a little while now, the technology has been used in the research context. So, uh, many of the families where deafness is segregating through the family have been able to get access to exome sequencing, usually because scientists have been interested in knowing what the genes are that are causing deafness. Um, and then also in a research capacity, some families have been able to access whole genome sequencing where we look at the entire genome, so all the bits of DNA through the genes as well as the genes themselves. But this hasn't been rolled out um, as a clinical diagnostic test really anywhere in the world. Um, and this is what we're actually going to be offering families over the next two years, exome sequencing as a diagnostic test. And the reason we're able to do that is because lots of other people have also recognised that this is a really powerful technology that we should be using um, to help families get diagnoses, not just for deafness, not just for rare syndrome, but for all kinds of um, genetically inherited conditions. So all of these groups in uh, Victoria have banded together and have lobbied government and have been given some money to actually assess the efficacy and utility of exome sequencing as a first line clinical diagnostic test that babies can access in hospital right from the very beginning when, they, when their doctor suspects that something's going on. So the aims of this project are to really assess the use of this genomic technology in day-to-day -day clinical practice. Um, we want to know whether it's actually acceptable to families to have this test, what's the uptake, do people actually want this information, how is it used by clinicians to then change the way we actually treat and manage particular um, children. Uh, and we also need to actually integrate a whole lot of new practices and processes in our hospital to actually be able to deliver this test effectively to families and actually give them the support to understand what the test is and the information that they've been given and how that's going to be useful. So we're hoping that what will come from this is that we'll be able to diagnose children very early and give them an access to the cause of the condition that they have. We hope that that will lead to early intervention in a lot of situations. It will hopefully decrease the number of tests that particular children have to have to try and get a diagnosis. And as a result, this will result in decreasing the cost that we have to um, outlay to actually diagnose children. We'll be using this new technology to do that. And we hope that we will lead to this concept of personalised medicine. So rather than just giving a diagnosis of deafness, you actually get a diagnosis of Usher syndrome right from the very beginning. And hopefully that will be helpful to us. So, 
I don't really need to go through all of this. But the idea is that what we're going to do is take into all of the genes, the coding bits of the DNA that actually exist. Um, and to do that, in the first phase of um, genomics, we actually recruited uh, patients coming into hospital with rare childhood syndromes, uh, colorectal, colorectal cancer, so these are adult patients, obviously, um, people with inherited neuropathies, acute myeloid, myeloid leukemias, and prochloroplasty. So this work was actually done over the last two years. It's been incredibly successful. And it's led to a dramatic increase in the number of patients who've been given a diagnostic a cause for their condition, a genetic cause. So this in using the traditional standard of care, we've been able to go from a diagnostic rate of about 14 percent up to a diagnostic rate of close to 60 percent just by delivering the next one second's result those failure. <coughs> so in this next phase of the number genomics project. We've been really lucky to actually get a flagship for deafness funded as well. And so in the second phase, we're going to be recruiting um, patients with congenital hearing loss. There are also projects for complex care cases, um, children with um, immunological conditions, uh, dilated cardiomyopathies and advanced cancers. So we're actually really lucky that we've been selected as a group to be able to um, test and implement this type of um, genetic testing. So over the course of the next two years, a total of 800 patients will be offered an exome sequencing, and 100 of those will be deaf children. And part of the reason why we've been able to access this funding from Melbourne Genomics is that we had a pre-existing program that some of you might already be aware of called Big Child. That stands for Victorian Child and Hearing Exchange <coughs> Longitudinal Data Bank, which is really mouthful. But what it is is that um, all of the children who are detected as having a hearing impairment in their um, initial hearing screen hospital have been invited to join this longitudinal data bank. And we've been running for a couple of years now, since 2012. And we've managed to recruit 500 families already into that data bank. And it just goes to what sort of you said this morning, that by having um, information from all of those families, we're actually in, much, in a much better position to actually run um, clinical trials like this exome sequencing trial and it also means that we're able to track kids over a really long period of time and look at their educational outcomes, look at the services that they've been able to tap into and try and offer them better support and a community to tap into as well. So the Big Child program is not only us to actually recruit children into the non genomics project. So the way we're doing that is Every baby that's eligible for the Melbourne Genomics Project will be sent this opt-out letter, which I don't expect you to read. But as part of this one-stop one shop we're trying to provide to families, they'll be invited to attend a clinic either at Royal Children's Hospital or at Monash or at Austin. Um, and we're hoping to provide better um, support for children with um, hearing impairment through those clinics. Um, we are also going to invite them to participate in the Big Child Project and also in the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance project. And parents are able to just come to clinic if that's all they're interested in. They can participate in the child and law in the Melbourne Genomics project as well. If parents opt to participate in the Melbourne Genomics project, they're going to be offered three different choices in terms of the actual genetic tests that they're given. So all of the babies will be exome sequenced. So we'll generate a sequence for all of their genes, but we'll only analyse the sequence in choice A from genes that are known to cause deafness. There's about 100 on that list. Parents can then also opt to have um, to have the laboratory actually look at the sequence of other genes that are known to cause childhood illnesses but they also have some kind of intervention available if they get that diagnosis. And then another list that they're able to have analysed are genes that are known to cause a childhood onset illness, but that at the moment don't have any known treatment. So we're actually interested in knowing what parents choose, what they actually want um, in terms of a diagnostic test, and whether that information is actually useful to them and is it useful to the training clinicians who have that information. 
So obviously, <laughs> the Ash and Jane are included in the United States. And the Ash and Jane, and lots of them, as been discussed already, are all included in this study. So we suspect that we might actually detect at least one baby over the past few years of Ash and <laughs> so just in summary, we're hoping that we'll be able to get a better idea about what types of genes are actually in the Victorian community that are causing deafness because up until now we haven't really been systematically testing anybody. So it will get a, give us a much better sense of what they're actually in in that community. Um, we'll hopefully be able to streamline the care of children here in Ross by um, really marrying the clinic with work and research and hoping that that actually provides a much better solid base for parents to actually come and get the information and good support. Um, we're hoping <laughs> that we'll be able to get a much better handle of parents' interests in this type of testing and do they actually want it? Is it useful? Um, we will also want to know whether actually genomic testing, part of the broader aim of the genomics project is to look at whether it's a useful test to actually use as a screening tool for the entire community. There's lots of um, screening tests that are already done for babies, um, and can we actually add a consistency in as a screening tool for the whole community? And again, the project will give us much more information on the feasibility of actually rolling this out in a clinical setting, and not just in a research setting. And I'm really here on behalf of all of these people here who are the drivers behind this genomics project and it's really been a long time coming. It's something that we've been aware that we needed or that we suspect that the community needs. And so all of these people have been um, really instrumental in getting the time and getting the project up and running. Um, I have to really specifically thank Lillian Browning, so she's the mum of Joseph, who's having his little dream test. And she's, um, She's doing a master's project at the moment. She's really driving the recruitment of the plan. So, thank you. I'm happy to take questions. been in this room for a really long time. Thank you, everybody. Um, we've had a, a, a pretty wide um, cross-section of talks today. We've had personal stories um, that have been shared with the tough times, but also the hope and, and, and the truth of just being the best person you can be um, as an adult with Usher syndrome and, and taking that away for those of us who have small kids. We've also heard from Mark Tanning about the role of the Usher Coalition in America and how they have taught us how to build a community which is so important not only for the families but also for the researchers. And the researchers have, have gone forward with that and talked about the importance of genetic testing to identify the cause of deafness and for syndromes like Usher for future research so that we can have um, a community that will be available for clinical trials here in Australia as well as around the world. So Usher Kids was formed obviously um, with the idea of bringing uh, families with younger kids together, but we have a great adult population that is supporting us and being ambassadors and role models for those kids. And thank you for all of those of you who are here with us today. Um, we obviously have quite a bit of follow-up to do, Emily and I, I don't think our work is, definitely doesn't stop today. Uh, we may take a break, but we will be loading everything onto our website 
um, over the next couple of weeks. We are happy to deal with any questions and forward them to any of the speakers um, on, their, on their behalf um, if that is something that you wish to do. But we couldn't be here today, firstly, without the support of our families. So a big thank you to Daniel and Dave and our kids who have put up with the stress heads that we've been for the last couple of weeks. Um, also to our Usher Syndrome Clinical Ambassadors, um, there's many of you here today, some of whom are listening in online and some of whom haven't been able to make it, the pediatricians, the EMTs, the ophthalmologists, the statewide vision resource centre team, the, the scientists and, and, and the people that work at CIRA, the Murdoch Research Institute, uh, the GSNB, who uh, we absolutely wouldn't be here without because they have organised this room um, and for us with their volunteers, the councillors who are here with us today, the early intervention teams, and Matt, who's been doing some photography. Thank you, everybody, um, and now we'll come and enjoy some lunch. <laughs>